All right, is that coming through? Yep, looks good. All right, welcome everyone. So, uh, as Ben mentioned, I'm at the uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, Biofuels SFA project. Uh, and this is a, a project that uh, we've been doing in collaboration with sort of the, uh, the Livermore team there, uh, especially with Jeff Kimbrell, who's by, been my partner in crime on developing these uh, tools for KBase, uh, and also in collaboration uh, very closely with uh, Chris Henry's uh, team at Argon. Um, and so the topic for today is on uh, integrating uh, third-party functional annotation tools uh, to do metabolic modeling in KBase. Uh, so you probably all know whole genome metabolic modeling has turned out to be one of these cornerstone techniques in systems biology um, because it really allows us to go directly from a genome sequence to saying something about what, what that organism might be doing with that genome. Uh, and there's very few techniques that allow you to make that giant leap. Um, but how do we even know that the underlying metabolic network we're working with is actually correct? Uh, for that matter, how do we know that the underlying enzyme annotations in the genome are correct? Um, currently, the sort of the default that people are still banding about is that it takes about half a person year to hand curate a quality metabolic model, right? That's obviously not something we can afford to do on any bacterial genome we're sequencing these days. Um, can we get anywhere closer to having a good quality model by computational means, right? So nowadays, you know, all of the computational, all of the uh, functional annotations that you see in a genome are essentially derived by some computational algorithm, right? Used to be once upon a time, JGI would have an entire army of like world experts in microbial metabolism that would hand curate uh, genomes. Um, nowadays, I don't know how many genomes they sequence every day, but clearly that can no longer be done by hand. Um, however, if you look at the number of unannotated genes, genes that essentially are lacking any annotation in a genome, we're still sort of at the same kind of levels that we were at several decades ago, where about 30 to 50% of genes are still lacking any annotation, right? They're just annotated as something like hypothetical protein, right? Um, there's different tools out there to do functional annotation, but they don't necessarily speak the same language. Uh, and they don't necessarily all cover the same sets of genes. And if they do cover the same genes, they don't necessarily assign the same functions to them. Um, we have noticed that there's greater discrepancies between functional annotation tools once you go outside of sort of the well-trodden path of, you know, farther away from things like E. coli or farther away from core carbon metabolism that has been heavily studied. Um, but the kind of organisms that DOE is often interested in, uh, sort of environmental isolates, things like that, or, or organisms that are changing these odd carbon sources in the environment, um, we're typically not talking about studying, you know, core carbon metabolism in E. coli, right? Um, now you might say, okay, we have these metabolic gap filling tools. So if, we, if we're if we making a metabolic model, at least sort of we can fill the gaps. Turns out that these gap filling tools are not necessarily consistent with each other as well. So you typically have an exponential uh, range of possible ways you can gap fill a model and different gap filling tools will actually take different decisions there and come up with different reactions to add. Um, so let's uh, take a little step back at one of the, the papers that originally inspired some of our work. Um, so we started out looking at this uh, paper is actually from 2011 out of uh, Nathan Price's lab uh, by Carol, Caroline Milne on uh, metabolic modeling in Clostridium, Clostridium bezerinki. Now it turns out Clostridium, Clostridium is one of those uh, 
you know, it's it's a genus that is hard to annotate to begin with. Um, it is far away from well-studied model organisms like E. coli, it's sort of phylogenetic, phylogenetically far away. Um, there are not terribly good resources available for annotations of enzymes, uh, which means that if you use a different uh, functional annotation tool and you build a model, you know, and you pick a second functional annotation tool and you build a model, those two models are going to be quite different, right? Which is a problem if you're trying to get one of these highly curated uh, uh, metabolic models out of this. The solution they came up with was um, to essentially look at multiple sources, and they decided to pick, uh, you see the Venn diagram there, uh, annotations from KEG. At the bottom there where it says the seed, that is essentially uh, RAST annotation. So that's the kind of uh, annotation that's built into KBase at the moment. Uh, and then top right, Biopsych, that essentially stands for um, annotations in the RefSeq version of the genome that were captured as uh, metabolic reactions in Biopsych. Um, and you see here that, uh, you know, each of these sources came up with around 500 different reactions. The total of the, the, the entire Venn diagram here uh, is around a thousand reactions. So by using multiple sources, they were able to almost double the size of the metabolic reconstruction. And I believe this, this Venn diagram is actually based on how many reactions each of these sources contributed to the final hand curated model. This is not just, you know, how many raw reactions you get. These are the, how many uh, hand curated reactions these were contributing. You also see that sort of if you only look at the center there where everything everybody agrees, that's only about a quarter of the entire model, right? And each of these sources contributed some set of reactions that were not find in, found in any of the other sources, right? Uh, so this is a bit of an extreme case as we found in our research later. Um, so we were inspired by this and decided to look at this question a little bit more broadly. So they, they just did it for Clostridium because they wanted to model, model Clostridium. Uh, we decided to look at uh, 27 different uh, bacterial reference genomes from across the bacterial tree. Uh, and we picked uh, four different tools that were all generating EC numbers at least, right? So on the previous slide, you know, KEG, RAST, Biopsych, they all generate reactions in the, in a different language, essentially, right? So KEG identifiers are not the same as RAST identifiers, are not the same as Biopsych identifiers. We made our life a little bit easier by picking four tools that were all generating EC numbers, at least, so we can uh, more easily look at the overlap between these. And, you know, across the entire bacterial tree of life, we were seeing similar kind of patterns that they were coming across for Clostridia, where on average, you can uh, get about 40% more EC numbers and about 40% more metabolic genes by considering multiple annotation sources in your metabolic reconstruction. Um, so that's... Um, you know, it's a little bit scary to know that there's so much disagreement between functional annotation tools, uh, but it also offers a possibility for greatly improving the quality of our annotations, right? Because if we can look at each of these annotation sources sort of as a different expert in microbial metabolism, you know, now we have a panel of experts and we can start looking at where is the consensus, uh, which expert has more expertise in a specific subtopic, things like that. Right. Um, so based on uh, these results, we were invited to add some tools to KBase to enable making uh, metabolic models for multiple annotation sources. So this is the, uh, the original metabolic modeling workflow uh, in KBase that uh, Chris Henry's team has uh, spent a, a lot of work on. And 
I have to say, let's start out with saying that this works really well to begin with. Um, what we're doing is adding more, uh, more tweaks to this, adding larger uh, sets of genes, adding larger sets of reactions that you may want to add to this. Um, if you're only going to be using one annotation tool anyway, you know, there's, you could do a lot worse than picking RAST. Um, but yeah, the original modeling workflow in Kbase essentially, you know, a user uploads a genome, you annotate that genome using RAST, which is built into Kbase, and then you use the model seed model builder uh, to build a uh, metabolic model out of that. And of course, RAST and the model seed model builder are pretty closely integrated with each other. Um, but you can see that there's things that are hard to squeeze into this, right? For example, it was actually hard to just take a couple of reactions that you find in a published paper and add that to this, this model, right? You would have to know the exact language that the model seed model builder requires to be able to incorporate that, or you have to start adding to the model by hand, essentially. Also, you know, people have grown up in different labs and maybe some folks out there don't like RAST and prefer doing their metabolic modeling using KEG, right? We're never going to have all of KEG inside of KBase, right? I mean, there's this license issues that prevent that from happening. Could we at least import KEG annotations and do metal do metabolic modeling on those within Kbase, right? Uh, so we decided to essentially uh, provide some tools to import external annotations uh, and sort of make that import as simple as possible with a very simple import format uh, and then integrate all these annotations as different annotation layers on the same genome and then use all of that for metabolic modeling. So that's the idea. So um, we have uh, three main uh, tools that we've added to Kbase. So this import annotations from staging on the bottom right there, um, that provides all of, you know, getting your annotations actually into Kbase. Uh, compare metabolic annotations then allows you to map those annotations to a, a common language essentially and see how much overlap there is between them. And then bottom right or bottom left router, merge metabolic annotations uh, allows you to then sort of do that uh, sort of consensus of experts essentially. Uh, how you combine these annotations from different sources and come up with a consensus set of annotations that you may want to use for the actual modeling. We've also import, uh, implemented a bulk import tool if you want to import multiple annotation sources simultaneously. Uh, so let's go through these uh, a little bit and introduce them a little bit more in depth and uh, after that I will actually switch to uh, looking at our um, narratorial, so there's a, a narrative tutorial that we have built, uh, which is a public narrative uh, that I will go through uh, sort of step by step and show how they are being used within KBase. So the import app, uh, first of all, uh, has to be able to deal with uh, metabolic reactions in different formats. Right, so you're probably all familiar with EC numbers, which is sort of one of the, the most canonical representations of enzymatic reactions. Uh, KEG has its own reaction identifiers and KEG ortholog identifiers. Um, Metapsych and Biopsych, again, it's a big resource out there that's publicly available for uh, metabolic network reconstruction but it uses its own set of reaction identifiers. And then Go Gene Ontology um, has a, num a whole section of the Go Ontology is dedicated to actual uh, um, biochemical function 
And a lot of those uh, co-identifiers or, or a good fraction of them uh, will map directly to uh, chemical reactions as well. Right. So those are the, the four main formats that we're allowing as import in our import app. Um, so that allows us to cover a wide range of different annotation sources, right? It now means that you can actually import all these high quality annotations that JGI produces in IMG. And you can take the EC numbers and Kegorta logs and Go annotations that they are adding in IMG, and you can import those into K-based for modeling. Um, you can download annotations directly from KEG. You can do your own annotations, KEG-based annotations. Um, again, if you have like a couple of reactions from literature, you can make your own little tiny text file and, and use that for importing those. And then there's a wide range of tools uh, that are generating EC numbers. And there's uh, actually more tools being developed now that are, that are generating uh, Go uh, annotations as well. Um, uh, I would love to do a little poll of the people that are here. Let's see, we have close to 100 participants here. Um, what kind of annotation tools do you prefer to use uh, in your daily work? Uh, so I have some of the, the more common ones that I put uh, in the poll here. Um, and I know this is going to be somewhat a crowd that's, uh, you know, biased towards using K-Base already. Uh, ooh, I see Keg is uh, gaining some tractions here. Um, did we have an other category? If, if you have an other response, so if there's something that's not on the list, feel free to put it in the chat, and we'll keep track of that in the chat as well. Yeah, eggnog, it's another good one. I was debating whether to put that one on there. I don't know how heavily it's used. Um, and of course, different fields uh, sort of have their own favorites. So if you're dealing a lot with, you know, plant and, and fungal and other eukaryotic annotations, you're going to be using quite different set of tools than if you're dealing with bacterial genomes, right? Yeah, and CBI, PJAP, uh, somewhat covered under sort of the, the RefSeq category in the poll, right? So all the RefSeq uh, genomes are annotated through a standard pathway, uh, but you can run that uh, pipeline yourself as well and annotate your own re uh, newly sequenced genome. Uh, all right, looks like the votes are somewhat stabilizing here. Okay, so we have uh, Keg is actually at the top. I don't know if any everybody can see the results. If not, uh, maybe Ben needs to uh, share the results so folks can see the, the end results of the poll. Yeah, I'll put a uh, image capture in the Q and A doc. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Keg is ahead with 63%. And again, people could uh, pick multiple options, I believe. So yeah, if you have definitely, if you have multiple tools that you like using, all the better for you. Uh, Rest and Proca were sort of somewhat neck and neck. Actually, it's interesting to see Proca is more heavily used, 46%, Rest 40%, RefSeq 26%, Interproscan 17 IMG 13 Drake. DRAM 4%. Um, I'm not sure I can actually scroll down to the bottom of the poll. There we go. There we go. Uh, Biopsych 19%, Patrick uh, 13%. So, and then Blast against a reference database like SwissProt or FSeq 35%. Uh, so that one is. Uh, Still a quite a, a favorite tool to use is blast against you know known known enzymes or blast against uh, known genomes. 
All right. So that was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, there, there is lots of tools out there. And as far as I'm concerned, the more tools that people use simultaneously, the better. Um, you know, if you're in a hurry, you just want to have a quick look at what things look like, you know, run it through whatever the default annotation tool is. Um, but, you know, if you want to have uh, something that's at least between sort of a quick draft and a fully hand curated model that takes half a person here to develop, you know, use multiple tools and see what comes out of it. All right, let's uh, continue in our slide. So that's sort of the, the import question, right? Um, now, how do we actually uh, compare all those different languages to each other, right? If we have an AC number and we have a Kagorta log or, or a, a Metapsych reaction, how do we know that those things are actually referring to the same uh, biochemical reaction? Um, so we're actually using the model seed biochem database in KBase as our, our lingua franca, as our common language to map all these reaction ontologies to. Um, and we recently published a, an update to the model seed biochemistry database. Uh, this was last year, um, sort of extending those uh, links uh, to all of the different uh, ontologies, essentially. And that allows us to uh, take annotations in a whole bunch of different languages and actually say, yes, this is a different annotation than that. Um, so now we can do things like, uh, uh, you know, at least give you a table of how many reactions are actually being mapped by each of these tools. We can start looking at overlaps. I mean, ideally, we would like to do these Venn diagrams with like, you know, five, six different sets, but that becomes infeasible very rapidly. So we had to come up with some, uh, some of our own tools to show uh, overlap between different sets if you're dealing with more than three where you can make uh, an easy Venn diagram. So we have a couple of visualization tools that we will show in action uh, a little bit later. Uh, and then once you can map all of these uh, annotations to a common language, to a common set of biochemical reactions, then you can start asking, can we actually integrate these and figure out which are the consensus annotations, right? So that's what we have our merge tool for. And we picked a, a very user customizable uh, way of merging these annotations together. You essentially assign a weight to each annotation source. And then for each uh, gene, you look at uh, which annotations it has from which sources and simply add up the uh, the scores for each of the annotation source and figure out which is the highest scoring annotation for each gene. Uh, and then you can decide to choose uh, all of the annotations that exceed a specific threshold or only the best annotation for each gene. Um, and that, you know, you can pick the, the weights for each of the sources. You can change the threshold. You can decide to pick uh, just the best annotation or everything ab ab across the threshold. And that allows you to implement a, a wide range of different annotation policies. Um, and I will show some of the ones that we've implemented in our, our public narrative as well. Um, it's important to point out, you can actually do something like a naive base classifier with this. Uh, if you pick your annotation, the weights assigned to the annotation sources appropriately, you can as essentially ask what is the probability that uh, gene X has annotation Y giving all of the evidence from the various annotation sources, right? So it's quite powerful, but it, it leaves a lot of choices up to the user essentially to set all of these parameters correctly. Um, and then the last bit, part of this is uh, adapting the metabolic modeling app that's in KBase to actually be able to use these annotations, right? So previously, uh, 
the, the model builder in KBase was very heavily tied into uh, the RAST annotation sort of internally. And uh, Chris Henry's team has sort of pulled out that functionality and make sure that uh, we can actually use these external annotations or the merged version of that as an input to the metabolic model builder. All right, so uh, I think at this point, I'd like to switch to our public narrative that we have available and I'll walk through uh, sort of how you actually use these tools within KBase uh, in practice. Uh, and you see the address of the, uh, the narrative right there. Um, I believe it is also in that uh, Q&A Google Doc. Uh, if somebody can actually paste the link in the chat, that would be useful. Um, or I can paste it in the lab for, in the chat for that matter. There we go. Uh, I'm actually going to go over a copy of it so I can actually make some changes and not disturb the, the public version of the of the narrative. Um, but I don't think you will be able to access that local copy of mine. So uh, so we're doing an example with uh, Streptomyces colicular, sort of beautiful actinomycete. Um, and I don't know how much I should sort of give an introduction to K-base in general. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar at least with the interface. Um, so the part here on the right is the narrative and sort of contains a mixture of text blocks in this case and code cells and the code cells can uh, show data or can show or, or can call an app that is available within KBase to work on that data. Right. So you have all your apps here in the bottom left. You have the data that's available to this narrative on the top left. So first thing we need to do is get a genome into KBase. And in our case, we're actually picking a genome that's, uh, it's actually a RefSeq genome, and therefore it's actually directly uh, available already in KBase. So if you go to the data browser under public, and you start typing uh, Streptomyces follicular, Uh, one peeve that I have with this search engine that is actually searching for each keyword independently, so you get all of the streptomyces. So often you're better off just searching for the most characteristic part of the, uh, the genome name. There we go. Now I only have 14 colliculars. Uh, and I know that the particular version of the genome that I want is actually this one. Uh, because in this narrative, I was essentially trying to recreate a published uh, uh, hand curated model that they based on this version of the, the genome. Uh, so once you've identified your genome, you can just hit that uh, blue add button and it'll get added to uh, your, your data window here. All right, so that's where the, that genome came from. All right, so. That's sort of KBase 101, right? How do you get something into KBase? Um, first thing you probably want to do is annotate by RAST. Uh, if you're going to be working in KBase anyway, you might as well. It's the annotation tool that's most uh, directly built into KBase. Um, so you can use this annotate microbial genome with RAST which you can find under metabolic modeling here. Actually, it's under genome annotation. Um, you can just do a search for RAST. That's probably going to be the easiest. Oops, there we go. And now we have all the, the RAST apps that are available. Uh, there is a, a little caveat here right now. Um, the released version of the REST uh, apps don't quite work correctly with sort of the ontology API that we're using. Uh, so if you want to replicate some of these uh, um, some of these uh, workflows, you're actually going to have to use the beta version of the app. So you can click on that, you know, 
this this was saying R before, now it's saying B, that's for release version versus beta version. And now if you search for Rast, you will have the beta versions of Rast. Uh, so you can use uh, annotate microbial genome with RASTK um, and annotate your genome. I'm not gonna run that right now. Actually, if anybody has a small bacterial genome and would like to you know, run through this kind of narrative alongside with us, RAST can take a couple of minutes though. Uh, so depending on the load on the, on the K-based server, RAST could take anywhere between you know, five minutes and half an hour if you have a big genome. Um, so I'm not gonna run that live, but you see the results here of uh, for this particular genome, uh, it finds 8,000 uh, genes, uh, and it assigns uh, seed ontology annotations to uh, 2,500 uh, genes across 1,300 distinct seed functions. That's not necessarily uh, 1,300 actual chemical reactions, because some of these functions are, are non-metabolic as well, I believe. All right, now the second thing you could do, could do is use the second functional annotation tool that's built into KBase currently, which is actually PROCA. Um, so what happens when you take an already annotated genome and you run another functional annotation tool on top of that? Um, so you might think, okay, maybe that's gonna overwrite the annotations from REST. No, that's that's not how it's actually implemented within KBase. This just adds another annotation layer within the same genome, or at least in, in the genome that you set as the, the output for, uh, for this app, right? So in, in our case, let me just show what I did here for uh, RAS to begin with. Uh, so for RAST, as input, I took that Sheptomyces genome that I imported, and as I said, output genome SEO RAST. So I think you can actually use the same output genome as your input genome and just keep overwriting your genome. Right. I, yep. I don't really recommend doing that because it's easy to lose track of, you know, you're sort of doing your own version control kind of um so the way i usually do things is that I create a new genome for each time that i add an annotation layer right so this one is called seo for streptomyces collicular rast when i added proca on top of that i get seo rast proca uh, and then the other ones are are sort of added on top of those right? um Okay, so that creates a new annotation layer. We can actually use one of our apps to visualize what's in there. So our compare metabolic annotations tool. Now, all of these apps, you're gonna run on one single genome to compare the annotations within that genome, right? You're not comparing annotations between two different genomes. Your annotation, uh, comparing the annotations that have been added as different layers to the same genome. So you pick your genome you want to study, which in this case is the one that has the rest and the PROC annotations. And then the user interface will show you the different annotation layers that are there. And you can choose, you can either just hit run and it'll automatically pick all of them, or you can pick some subset of these and it'll, it'll uh, uh, do the comparison. So the, and I'll, I'll show you some of the, uh, uh, comparison visualizations that we have. But uh, first of all, it gives you a table and shows you, okay, this many genes, uh, this many unique terms in, in this case, either the seed subsystem ontology or the EC numbers that PROCA is generating. Uh, and these map to this many unique actual model seed reactions. So these are the metabolic reactions we can actually use for modeling. And then we also have sort of the unique uh, gene to reaction pairs, right? So unique uh, different annotation units, essentially. All right, so, um, so let's add some more annotations to this. Um, 
most of bioinformatics seems to be about making sure you're you're you have the right identifiers for everything, right? So if you try to import some annotations you find in, in an external source and try to import them in Kbase, the first thing you need to make sure is that your identifiers for the genes actually match. Um, the easiest way to make sure of that is actually once you have a genome in Kbase, you download the FASTA files for all the proteins directly from Kbase. That way, you know you have the exact same proteins you're dealing with, with the exact same identifiers. And then you can submit that FASTA file to some external annotation tools. And you know, you, you know you'll be able to integrate those annotations back into Kbase, right? So there's a little tool called Text Reports Genome, uh, where you can download different sort of aspects of a genome in different formats. In this case, I picked FASTA for the translated CDS. Uh, so that gives you all of the, the protein sequences, essentially. Uh, so that's an easy hack to make sure you can actually, actually integrate these results later. And then uh, the tools that we've used in this narrative include uh, KEG. Uh, I've also incorporated uh, reactions from pathway tools. Uh, and then we have a couple of sort of uh, deep learning tools like deep EC that generates EC numbers. NetGo produces uh, Go annotations. Uh, you can definitely also get uh, annotations from JGI, from IMG in here. Um, I didn't do that because, you know, JGI doesn't necessarily use the same identifiers. Um, Actually, I haven't tried that. We should be able to map for this strepto streptomyces collicular uh, genome in JGI. We can probably just download the annotations from JGI uh, and import them directly into Kbase because they will be linked to the RefSeq identifiers for the proteins. So that likely should work, but I haven't tried it for this organism. Um, so let's start with uh, uh, KEG. Um, and I'm not going to go do a whole tutorial on how to do KEG annotation. This is still a K-based uh, webinar. But I wanted to show you briefly uh, sort of the tools that are available for you to annotate your own genome uh, with, it, with KEG. And there's sort of three uh, related tools. There's Blast Koala, Ghost Koala, CoFAM Koala. Uh, typically, you want to be using the one that's most on the left. Blast Koala works slightly better than Ghost Koala, but takes a lot more resources. Uh, so there's limitations on how many genes you can submit to it. Um, Ghost Koala, you can actually run on an entire metagenome, so it can handle much larger data sets. Uh, its output is not quite as good as Blast Koala, but almost as good. And then CoFAM Koala, its main purpose is it's a it's a portable tool essentially. You can download the uh, the CoFAM uh, hidden Markov models and the tool to actually run CoFAM and run it locally. Right. Uh, CoFAM Koala again is not going to give you the same kind of performance as Blast Koala and Ghost Koala. But if you want to run something locally on your own server, high throughput, you know that's the way to do it. Uh, so I, I did uh, Blast Koala, and um, the nice thing about uh, uh, these Koala tools is they provide an output that can be directly imported uh, within uh, uh, within Kbase using our import tool. Right. So this is the first time we're using our import tool. And you see that I have actually linked a file that we're importing here, uh, which I will briefly open up. See if this still works. That would be nice. Um, and this is just a tab separated file with two columns. Uh, so as soon as it opens up, there we go. So the first column it has the gene IDs. The second column has, in this case, cog ortholog numbers. Um, and you see that the, the second column doesn't have to be filled in. That's just the output that uh, this Blast Koala tool provides. It just skips the line if there's no term filled in. Um, 
Some tools will give you potentially multiple annotation terms on the same line, and then you have to use your own little script uh, to put those on separate lines. We do need to have one annotation tool, one uh, annotation term, or no more than one annotation term per, per line. So you see, it's a very simplistic input format that we're using for all of our imports. Uh, all right, so our import tool automatically already runs sort of the, the comparison and it gives you a table that uh, tells you how many genes and terms uh, are have been added. And you can, so you have multiple uh, sort of reports that come out of this. Let's look at get ontology that gives you the larger uh, table of what's currently in the genome. So again, we have the RAST annotation, the PROC annotation. Now we have this BLAST Koala annotation that's been added to it as well. All right. So let's see, make sure that I end on time. We only have 10 minutes left. Um, so to run this import app, you just have to specify what genome you want to add something to. What is the annotation type? And again, we have EC numbers, KEG, KOs or reactions, metapsych reactions, uh, model seed, uh, reaction identifiers, go identifiers, and seed subsystem ontology if you want to sort of do the, the raw uh, seed subsystem reactions as well. Hey, Patrick, uh, we got a request for you to enlarge the screen and maybe yeah, do a full window. Thank you. Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I can also uh, embiggen the font if, if that is needed. Yeah, it looks good. All right, so, uh, so that's the import, right? So we're doing the same thing with annotations from DeepEC. Um, and again, DeepEC, the output you can import directly. Um, annotations from NetGo. Uh, and we also did annotations from Pathway Tools. I'm not gonna show you that. Let's see, where is the Pathway Tools version? Right, so Pathway Tools is useful if you have just text annotations. So you have names of enzymes in a GenBank file, for example. So it turns out uh, SRI's Pathway Tools, which is sort of the, the tool that's behind BioPsych and MetaPsych, uh, provides you with a really good text parser that can strip out all of these uh, names of enzymes you can find in the genome annotation and translate those into reaction identifiers that you can then import into KBase for modeling. So that's a, a, a nice trick if you just have, you know, uh, something like a GenBank file. All right, so uh, let's switch to compare app. So uh, this is where we are now. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different annotation sources that have been uh, added on top of the same genome, essentially. Uh, and now we can start looking at how these overlap. And I encourage you to sort of explore some of these different reports that are come out of this. Uh, let's see. So this Get Ontology Summary provides you with the table. Uh, totals allows you to look at essentially the same data that's in the table, just in a different format where you, I should have reloaded these. Okay. Um, here you see uh, the results sorted first by annotation source and then by, you know, the number of genes, number of terms, model seed reactions, and then gene to model seed pairs. You can also uh, sort that by type, essentially just reshuffling this uh, this graph. So now it's grouped by you know the reactions or the the, the individual types of uh, columns, and within these clusters you have uh, uh, all the different annotation sources. Right. Um, 
let's see. The cumulative sum is quite interesting to look at as well. Uh, so that's sort of our solution for not being able to draw, you know, Venn diagrams with seven sets. Um, gee, why is it doing this? There we go. Let's do this one. For, all right. So we're showing here the uh, the actual reactions. How many reactions do these sources map to? And uh, this is sort of like a, a greedy representation. You start out with the one that uh, produces the largest number of reactions, and you present those in a single color. And then the next tool that adds the most reactions, and you show the overlap in the same color as the, the, the previous one. Right? So you can see each of these tools adds a certain number of reactions that was not find by the, found by the other ones but each of them also has a certain amount of overlap with the other tools. All right. So then merging the reactions, I'm going to have to go over this uh, a little bit faster. So I already mentioned there's different ways of merging the reactions, right? Based on how you set the weights for each, uh, the weights for each uh, annotation source. The interface here is a little bit more confusing because you have to pick each annotation source that you want to include in the merge from this uh, sort of drop down menu of all the sources that are in there. Uh, so you see uh, we picked our genome with six annotation sources in here. Uh, this will only show the top five, but you can go to the next, uh, you know, the sixth one by using these up and down arrows. You see that we've picked one of these here. So you would just click on an annotation source you want. And then you can add the annotation weight that you want to use for uh, that annotation source. Uh, in this case, we've set all of the annotations uh, weights to one. So we have went through each of these and picked each of the annotation sources in turn. And then we set a threshold to 0.5. And that essentially gives you the union of all of them. Right. Uh, if you have an annotation from any source, it's going to be included in the merge. And I call the, the merge SEO union. So that's one way of doing the, the merge. Um, you can do the same thing, but then at the end, you choose um, keep highest score and annotation only. So in this case, this one is checked. The previous one, it was not checked. Uh, that includes all of the annotation from all the sources, but then for each gene, it only picks the highest scoring annotation. Uh, so that's sort of majority rule. Uh, the next one we implemented here <clears throat> is... Uh, <clears throat> Scroll down two or more, uh, <clears throat> which is same thing as before. You set all the weights to one, but now the threshold is 1.5. So you have to have le at least two sources that are uh, describing the same annotation for a gene. Right. And then the last one I did here was a... Uh, was a priority list where essentially I went through each of these tools in turn and I gave uh, NetGo a weight of one, I gave DeepEC a weight of two, PROC a weight of four. So each time you give it double the weight of the previous ones. And that means that if there is a RAST annotation, it's gonna use the RAST annotation. If there isn't a RAST annotation, but there's a CAG annotation, it's gonna use that one, right? Um, and then I, I clicked on keep high scoring annotation only. So it, it essentially goes through each of these tools and sort of picks the one that's, that you've said is, is the most reliable, essentially. Right. So, and then you can use uh, these annotation sources for metabolic modeling. And again, there's a, a couple of different settings in the metabolic modeling tool that you should be aware of. Uh, and they're hidden under this show advanced option here. Um, 
If you have use internal annotations checked, uh, it's essentially going to use the internal REST annotations. It's not going to use any of these annotations that you've imported. Right, so that is something important to know. If you want to use the additional annotation layers that you've added, you have to uncheck this button here. Uh, so the next one here actually uses keg model. Let's have a look at that. Um, so here under show advanced, we've unchecked use internal annotations, and now you can choose again from this uh, list of annotation sources that's available in the genome. You can choose which one to use. Um, note that uh, these like two or more policies that I talked about, or this majority rule policies, I've just added those as additional annotation layers in the genome, right? So you can pick any of these. You can, you know, make a model just from DPC if you want, or you can pick that uh, two or more policy for merging and make a model out of that. Note that you don't actually have to use the merge tool, right? Um, the way that the uh, model builder was modified, you can actually pick multiple annotation sources uh, and then say merge all selected annotations. And it's just gonna do a union of those essentially. Um, so that's there's already a little bit of that merge functionality built in the model, to, in the model builder. And then you get uh, different metabolic models out of that with different numbers of uh, reactions and genes, depending on which merge policy you're, you've picked. And I don't want to get into sort of exactly how you, which merge policy you should be using. That's sort of up to a choice by the user, essentially. Um, it depends on what your application is. If you want to focus just on the most highly reliable annotations, you could take intersections of a bunch of these. If you want to cast as wide a net as possible, you can take the unit of all of these, or you can do something in between, right? Uh, where you do like this two or more, or something along those lines. Um, obviously, there is lots of room for sort of adding more smarts to how you set these parameters. You can build an entire machine learning tool around this to pick the optimal parameter settings for each of your annotation sources you have available. Uh, and we're actually working on a paper that's going to be describing some of this merging tools. Um, and so, yeah, that's that will be upcoming work, though. Um, and I'm not going to get into that too much. So we're, we're picking, uh, um, what do we have now, six different uh, sort of reference genomes for which we have highly curated hand-built uh, metabolic models. And we're seeing how close we're getting using uh, a number of different annotation sources and just doing different merge policies, essentially. Um, just as a demonstration of the flexibility of, uh, of this method. Um, now, just doing intersections or unions uh, is not necessarily the best answer to this problem. Uh, you saw that uh, on the earlier Venn diagrams in the beginning of the talk, you saw that if you look only at the intersection between all of these uh, annotation tools, you wind up with a very small number of genes and reactions. And if you focus on the union of all of them, you're going to wind up incorporating lots of false positives. Um, so the eventual answer will probably be to actually also recruit the gap filling app into, into this. Um, so you would build a model based on the most reliable parts of the annotations first, and then you can actually tell the gap filling model, the gap filling tool to now gap fill and give priority to the other annotations that are found in this genome, even if they might not have, you know, uh, risen to the, the, the score that is needed to be included in the original model, you know, at least some tool out there predicted that this reaction is present. So we should prioritize that for gap filling rather than just picking completely random uh, gap filler reactions. 
Uh, and I've, I'm already going over my time. Uh, I believe uh, Chris actually had a little demo of the gap filling tool uh, available. I don't know if we want to go into that. Uh, yeah. Are you sure. able to? Are you able to do a very quick overview? Perhaps we're, we're already at uh, a little bit past eleven by now. Yep. Yeah, I think the webinar goes to one thirty. So. Right. Yes. So we have some time for questions as well. The, the main presentation yeah. was supposed to be an hour. I'll, I'll um, be super fast. Uh, yeah. If I can, let me share let me, my screen. Uh, stop share here on my end, and you can have a, a quick look at. Okay. I, the thing I want to emphasize here is this is hot off the presses. Uh, <laughs> this is a new app. Think of it more as a prototype. But it's pretty cool. Uh, I think it's going to get a new name because currently, so the new app is called Gap Fill Metabolic Model. But if you search for Gap Fill Metabolic Model, uh, you'll see there's two of them now. There's the old one, which is FBA tools, and there's the new one, which is now in a standalone module called Metabolic Model Gap Filling. And this is part of a general thing we're doing now, of translating all of our modeling stuff to Python, which um, uh, I think we'll, people will be really excited about as that happens. Um, the, the new gap filling app lets you specify an input model and it lets you specify multiple media conditions. Um, currently they get, what that means is the model will get gap filled in each of these media conditions one at a time um, until uh, it, it grows in all of them. Um, and currently that's done in serial, but eventually there'll be a simultaneous version, which simultaneous is the best. And the, the goal here is that you, this app can eventually uh, instantly optimize a model for biolog, for something like a biolog experiment. So you could put in, you know, hundreds of media conditions, and it will get the model to grow in all of them and not grow in others. So there's negative media, and that's what that is, a, a list of media you don't want the model to grow in. Um, and that's not implemented yet. So that's an example of the prototypeness of this. But it will uh, gap fill multiple medias. Um, you pick a reaction to opt to maximize, um, and it has a source model, and that's for integration, integrating chem informatics. Uh, so if you run PICAX and you make a predicted network of reactions, you can gap fill from that network, which lets you add novel pathways to the model. Um, and uh, you can do knockouts and other things. No, none of the knockouts are implemented yet, just the basic uh, gap filling. Um, the key thing about this app is if you look at the results, you'll see it looks better than the current gap filling app. Um, if it pops up here, uh, minimize this. it gives you a little summary. This will probably be improved well, again when this is no longer a prototype. Tells you how many medias it gap filled, how many reactions it added, and how many it made reversible. And then there's the reactions themselves, and it gives you a little table of all the reactions that were added, the direction it was gap filled in. And the genes. So this is the key thing. The previous gap filling app did not add genes to your model ever. It only ever added reactions. It was up to you to find genes for those reactions. This app will add genes to your model and it will add genes to your model using your other annotation sources. So in this example, what I'm built gap filling, I took a model that was built from RAS using the build Metabolic model app. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I, took an existing model built from RAST only, but the genome has all of these other annotation sources loaded. And so what the gap filling does is it uh, reduces the penalty on reactions based on how many uh, annotations indicate that that reaction should be in the model. And not just that, it looks at uh, this reaction and if the gap filling chooses that to add that reaction because it needs to it needs that reaction to grow on a media for example like minimal media um, the gap filling will look at all the genes at all the different annotation algorithms let's let's say you load uh, you know RAS, proca um, CAG, uh, etc it'll look at all those and the gene with the greatest consensus or the greatest score annotation score um, it will add that gene to the reaction so this method not only improves the gap filling solution in general because it's picking reactions with evidence but it's actually giving you a gene candidate 
for the reactions and it will put that gene candidate in the table and note you know it doesn't always find the gene that's what this column is. It doesn't always find the gene for everything it gap fills um but that's the idea of the app and uh, again still a work in progress uh but it's a nice it offers some really nice functionality above and beyond the current gap filling app like gap filling multiple media at once um but it also it has this it integrates the annotations and that's the exciting thing so like as patrick said um all these annotation sources if you just keep everything you get false positives what's nice about gap filling is you can use phenotype data experimental data to cherry pick um so you're picking the annotations to keep that ex that conform with your phenotype data so if you have bilog array with 50 media that you know your organism should grow on it'll keep the annotations that explain how it's growing on those 50 media but it will not keep any annotations that don't um so that's uh, that's what excites me about this is, is we have this now system in kbase to like systematically load lots of annotations into a genome from lots of different sources and then use tools like gap filling to use to mesh with experimental data like tnc and biolog arrays um to to pick the ideal set of annotations to keep and give you the best fit um so that's that's what I got. Um, and then the, so the, it gives a, a, it creates a model with the gap filled reactions added to it. So again, um, prototype, it's only available in beta uh, and it's probably going to change in, in the next few days or, or weeks uh, as I add more functionality. So it's not stable at the moment, but if you wanna play with it, um, please um, play with it and I'd welcome comments. Oh, Patrick, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so I would like to thank some of the folks that have contributed to this, uh, especially the uh, uh, Jeff Kimbrell and Chris Henry, who have been tremendous collaborators on this project, and all the all the folks over at Livermore in the SFA project and at uh, Chris's team at Argonne. Uh, and we are open to questions. So someone just dropped a big question in the chat. Um, and yes, yeah, he looks like most of the questions in the Q&A have been addressed. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I see some, there's some new questions coming in. Yeah, do, do uh, you want to take a question at the or uh, stab at the question from Sheila in the chat there? There's four parts. Um, is it at the bottom or? Yeah, it's at the bottom. All right. Uh... Are the models available for exporting details rather than summaries of K-based annotations? For example, a table of the genome locations for individual predicted proteins, nucleotide coding sequences, predicted amino acid sequences, um, GFF format. I'm not sure if you can export as GFF. You definitely can do exports of, uh, of various aspects of um, the genome, including, you know, all the protein sequences, all the nucleotide sequences. Uh, so that is definitely available. Uh, let me show you some of the possibilities there. All right, so you can take any of these uh, genomes and you can go through here and do uh, a download. And you have a couple of different formats through which you can export, including GFF and FASTA, GenBank, uh, or JSON. Um, I already mentioned that uh, export function. Um, it's under uh, text reports, I believe. Let's see. It's not responding. Okay. There we go. Um, 
so under utilities, there's a couple of uh, text report functions where you can get output from uh, assembly domain annotation, uh, genome information. So if you click on here, you have a couple of different ways you can export. So you can uh, get a tab limited uh, set of features. You can get a GFF. You can get uh, the nucleotide sequences. You can get uh, the, the protein sequences. So yeah, most of those export functions are under there. Uh, I'm probably spending too much time on each answer, but that's okay. Um, let's see. Somebody at the, I started reading at the top of the list, of course, with the Q&A. Uh, so somebody had asked, uh, can you import, let's see, uh, can we add reactions to the FDBA models, right? So that's exactly, that's a perfect application for this import annotations tool that we have. You can make this little uh, text file with sort of a two column format where you have uh, uh, gene identifiers in the left column and the reaction identifiers in the right column. You could just use the import tool to add that to the genome and then uh, use that as part of the model builder, right? And the model builder, if you, you know, pick the reaction identifier that actually corresponds to your reaction and model seed, it will, will incorporate that into the model. Uh, once you have a model, you can also use that edit metabolic model app to uh, add things to it directly. Uh, let's see, were there other questions that have not been answered yet? Let me scroll to the bottom here. Uh, how do you decide which annotation is best for you? Yeah, that's that's a hard one. Uh, and which combination of annotation tools is best? And does Raspberry work better than Keg for my genome? Um, if you're doing Archeal annotation, you know, what tool works better than what other tool? Um, these are questions that were very hard to answer before, because the first thing you have to do to answer this question is map everything to the same common language, right? And we have the tools now in KBase to start asking those questions. I'm not going to say we have the answers yet. Um, but yeah, you could totally, you know, if you have a good reference data set on sort of gold standard annotations, uh, you could now ask, does annotation tool A provide better quality annotations than annotation tool B? Or does it give a more complete genome reconstruction uh, or a, a metabolic network reconstruction? Um, uh, let's see. Any other questions? There's a couple of questions on the gap filling that uh, maybe Chris is better suited to answer. For new gap filling app, what is the source or database that new genes are added to the model? So that is all based on the existing annotation layers that you've added to the genome, right? So my, my interpretation of what uh, Chris's new version of the app does, it will uh, give a higher priority to the the metabolic reactions that have been annotated by any source that is available in the genome, right? Yeah, Even if it is, wasn't it uses, already in the original model. It uses the model seed uh, database. Um, remember I mentioned source model though. With source model, any biochemistry that you can load in the K-base as a model um, can be used by the gap filling. So if you have a totally new pathway that you've invented, if you can describe it as a model, uh, and soon we'll have tools to automatically load models from Cobra Pi, for example. Um, if you can describe it as a model, um, then you can load it in the K-Base and then get, it can be, be integrated into the gap filling. To be integrated properly, it needs to be described in terms of our model seed ontology, uh, meaning that any, any compounds in that pathway that overlaps with our database, they have to have model seed IDs for the compound. Compounds is what's most important. Um, but for example, we use this with our Chem Informatics tool, Pickaxe. You can 
generate novel reactions and pathways and compounds and novel stuff to explain metabolomics data, for example, and then integrate that into a model to um, push flux through metabolomics data. So that, like, that's one of the things that's unintuitive things is, is that these apps are capable of doing. Um, was that eventually we'll have apps that specifically do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all pri the primary database is the model C. And the most important thing for gap filling and, and metabolic modeling in general is that you have consistent compound IDs because uh, yeah. um, uh, otherwise, if, if you have two compounds and they have different IDs, the FBA doesn't realize they're the same thing and the, the constraints don't fit together, don't map together. Dirty little secret of bioinformatics, you know, at least 50% of bioinformatics consists of translating IDs to each other, whether it's gene IDs or reaction identifiers or whatever. Um, it's, yeah, that one at the very bottom about using a, a model versus, um, yeah. Uh, beta protein bacteria can be quite far away from E. coli. I would not, uh, I would not start out from a template like E. coli unless it was closely related to E. coli to begin with. And, and a beta protein bacteria, I would not consider that close to E. coli. I would start from scratch with an annotation. You'll probably get better quality annotations than you would get for Clostridia. Um, but yeah, just run it through Rast and see what comes out of it to begin with. Um, you know, if running things through Keg only takes, you know, if you use a, a Blast Koala, it might take an hour or two before you get the answers back. Uh, but in an afternoon, you can run it through, uh, you know, Rast, Proca, and Keg and combine those in, in Kbase. And I would trust that a lot more than starting out by saying that this beta protein bacteria probably looks like E. coli. It probably doesn't. All right. Um, Any other questions that haven't been answered yet? I think we've gotten to Pretty much all of these, uh, there's a couple of kind of duplicate questions that I think we answered about uh, preferences of annotation sources. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much, Patrick and Chris and Jeff uh, for, for coming on and doing this presentation. I think uh, it was very helpful for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, thanks again for all of the hard work in developing these tools. Uh, I think we'll have uh, quite a few uh, users of them. So. Uh, thanks again to all of the people that showed up today uh, to attend the webinar. Um, uh, please uh, give some feedback if you don't mind. I'll drop a, a link into the chat here uh, for the feedback form and I'll send it around afterward as well. Um, and if you like uh, today's webinar, uh, be sure to sign up for our webinar that is next week, our taxonomy tools webinar. And I'll drop a link to that in the chat. Similarly, uh, we've had uh, some collaborations developing new taxonomy tools via the uh, DOE SFA program. So excited to share with all of you uh, all of this hard work. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, get a lot out of it for your research and uh, and uh, and keep using Kbase. So, and if you want to have access to the slides that I presented today, uh, I'll put the link in the chat as well. I believe that's also in the, uh, the Q&A doc that people were using and the link to the narratorial that sort of covers how to use these tools. I will put that in the chat as well. All right. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Thanks for watching this webinar. For more webinars and tutorials, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can see announcements for upcoming webinars and recordings for previous webinars on our website at kbase.us slash learn. Let us know in the comments what content you'd like to see in future webinars. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at DOEKBase. And if you have questions or encounter an error when using Kbase, please contact the help desk.